So if you have your Bibles, let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter number 1. Revelation chapter 1. And uh, we'll read as our text, verse 4. Revelation chapter 1, verse 4, it says, John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. This morning I want to continue the series that I started a while ago. Uh, the series is called Neglected Church Truths. And this morning I want to bring a message on the subject of the church local, not universal. The church local, not universal. These churches uh, in our text were local to their particular area. We find that in the chapter before us that they each had a particular city that they were in. They also had a particular pastor. But in our world we find that uh, in the religious world there is the idea of a universal invisible church. We also find that there is the idea of a universal visible church depending on who you talk to and where you're at, uh, what kind of a group you're talking to. But the idea of a universal church is not to be found in the Bible. So we must ask, where in the world did such an idea come from? Well, <clears throat> we'll get into some scriptures here in a little bit to look at the idea of a local church, but I just want to say a few things about the idea of a universal church. Because the idea of a universal church had to come from somewhere, so we must ask, where did it come from? The idea of a universal church, the idea first started with the universal visible church, and that came from the Catholics. In fact, the word Catholic is a uh, universal uh, visible church. Uh, that's kind of where it came from. And uh, when Martin Luther became upset with some of the things that were going on, with Catholicism in his day, uh, he began to try to reform it. But his reformation was not a full break with Rome. In fact, the reformers who got out of Rome did so only partially. And they did so only to wander eternally in the wilderness. I've mentioned in previous sermons in this series that they held on to such pillars of popery such as infant baptism and when it comes to church doctrine they held on to certain ideas and so while they rebelled against the idea of the universal visible church they rejected the new testament church type as found in the pages of the scriptures. And so the post-Reformation leaders came up with another theory to set over against the papal theory. And so they presented the world with the idea of the universal invisible church, which is so common in our world today. And... Uh, these things, universal church, no matter which flavor you want to look at it, are not found in the scriptures. And I submit to you today that the Baptist who says that they are a branch or a section of a universal church is either confused at best, perhaps unlearned or untaught, and maybe, maybe even a Baptist in name only at worst. And so be careful and examine these things in light of the Scriptures. And that's what we want to do today. In our King James Bibles, the word church is found 
uh, in the English, 77 times. The word churches is found 37 times. Added together, that brings us 114 times. Now, the Greek word that is translated church is the word ekklesia. It is found 116 times in the Greek. Three of those times it was translated assembly. That leaves us one short for what we need for churches and church. However, that there is that one time where the word church comes from another Greek word, and that is Acts chapter 19 and verse 37, where it says, For ye have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. That word robbers of churches there in the Greek is the word herosulus, and it means temple despoiler or robber of churches. It doesn't make a difference doctrinally. And uh, so let's begin to look at this word ecclesia, the word church in our Bibles, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. The very first time that it is used in the New Testament. In Matthew chapter 16, in verse 18. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This is the very first time that the word church is used. It is used, it is used by our Lord. Uh, if, you, uh, if you have, most, uh, most Bibles have the words of Christ in red. You notice that it is in red. Jesus is speaking here. He did not... He did not invent the word church or the word ecclesia. He borrowed it from the Greeks. He did not put into it any unfamiliar or unusual meaning. It means assembly. It means congregation, gathering, or meeting. It was a local thing and nothing more. It is amazing to me as I read, and I'd love to read, I have... Many, many books in my library. Those who helped me move or have been in my study, you know that I have a lot of books. Um, those who helped me move, it's been a number of years. I uh, just know that I have a lot more books now than what I had when I moved. And uh, those who have been in my study, uh, if you haven't been there lately, I have more than what I had previously. In fact, uh, over the past month, I believe I've added 60 books to my library. But anyway, uh, I love to read and, and study, and, and, and it's amazing to me that uh, there are some very learned men who uh, go, through, go through the scriptures with them in their, in their writings, and it seems like they're going very well. Uh, they seem to be rightly dividing the word of truth. It seems like they can add 1 plus 1 equals 2. And uh, then you get into where they're writing about the church and they begin doing some weird things with the scriptures. And all of a sudden 1 plus 1 equals 5. And you think, what in the world are they doing with the Bible? What are they doing with the word church? What are they doing here with God's word? Because they start pulling some very strange <coughs> Doctrinal gymnastics, and, uh, and and not making much sense, and even some of them will admit that in the scriptures the word ecclesia means a local called out assembly, and then they'll admit that it wasn't until year such and such that it began to mean this and that and the other thing, and by their own admission, they will begin to say things that the Scripture never intended. As I mentioned, 
in this very series. The scriptures must be our only rule of faith and practice. So let us see what is this church that Jesus built. What is this assembly, this congregation, this gathering, this group that he's talking about? Let us see some characteristics of the Lord's church. So first of all, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, First Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 23. If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? So, notice, he's writing to the church of Corinth, and he says, if the whole church be come together, there is no place on earth that a universal church could ever come together. The whole church cannot come together in one place if the church were universal, whether it's visible or invisible. The, whether you look at the Catholic version of the church or the Protestant version of the church, the Bible does not, does not teach either version. The Bible teaches a local church that can come together. A local church. A local ecclesia. In... Uh, in this, the whole church come together in one place. In Acts chapter 16, in Acts chapter number 16, And when she was baptized in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. I'm sorry, Acts 16 and verse 5. I was in verse 15. Uh, in verse 5 it says, And so were the churches established in the faith and increased in number daily. The Bible takes great care here to tell us that the churches were established in the faith and increased in number daily. It was plural churches, not the church universal. So churches, local ecclesia, uh, the ecclesias, the different churches, each one with their own locality, each one with their own a place where they met, each one with their own pastors, deacons, and so on. In the book of Acts chapter 11 and verse 22, notice what it says here. Acts chapter 11 and verse 22. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem and they sent forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. The church that was in Jerusalem. A local church that was there in Jerusalem. Just like we can say that there is a church in Mansfield so there was one in Jerusalem. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, Unto the church of God which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 
there was a local church at Corinth as well. So just like there was one at Jerusalem, then later there was one at Corinth, different than the one that was at Jerusalem. In chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians, in verse 17, For this cause have I sent unto you Timotheus, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. There was more than one church. Paul taught in those churches, and, uh, and, and, and he recognized that that word ecclesia was local. He was talking about different local churches. Just like, just like uh, we recognize today that there are different local churches uh, that, we, that we recognize as being the Lord's churches. Uh, we have a list of them up on the board here. Uh, many of them, uh, or those that are on the, on the board here, are churches that are having meetings that we are uh, going to be part of, Lord willing, in some way, shape, or form. We're either praying for those meetings or I'm going to be preaching at them. We recognize them as churches. We exchange pulpits with them. Uh, these are the churches of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're local assemblies in different places, whether they're in Temperance, Michigan, or in Naples, Idaho, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are all local churches just following the New Testament pattern. In the book of Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 1, beginning at verse 11, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a golden with a garment down to the foot, and girt, girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like undefined brass, as if they burned in a furn furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying, Unto me fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Have the keys of hell and of death. Write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. We notice that the seven churches here listed in the book of Revelation that they were local, that they were visible, but also we noticed that they were independent of one another. And that is a characteristic of this word, ecclesia, that that's a characteristic of the New Testament church. Some folks ask what, what group we're part of, what convention we're part of, what fellowship we're joined up with? Are we 
part of the SBC, the ABA, what, and, and, and there's all sorts of them that are out there, but, but if we look in the scripture, there are none of these. These parachurch organizations, really, that, that, that people have come up with since the days of the New Testament, they, they're, they're not scriptural. And I know that sometimes whenever, whenever we speak out against these things and, and, and these mission boards and all this, sometimes whenever you preach out against these things, people get their feelings hurt like as, if, like as if you've picked on their firstborn son or something. But the reality of it is that when we get into a subject like this, the church being local and not universal, we've got to understand that in this teaching of the word ecclesia, the churches were local, they were visible, and they were independent of one another. They had fellowship with each other, and sometimes they had they gave advice to one another, but they certainly did not exercise authority over one another, and there was no such thing as an organized fellowship or an organized convention or an organized board on the pages of any scripture in the New Testament. Now there are some arguments that people will give when it comes to the teaching before us. And they'll say that they have found within the pages of Scripture evidence for the universal church. One of those evidences that they say they find is in Matthew chapter 16. And let's go back over there. We were there a moment ago, but let's go back there and look at it again. In Matthew 16 and verse 18. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And so some folks will point to this passage, and they'll say, well, here is evidence for the universal church. But whenever we compare this passage with other passages in the Scripture, we know that this cannot be. He was speaking about his kind of church. Uh, he used the word ecclesia. He did not use uh, a different word. Uh, there, is a, uh, there is a Greek word that he could have used, but he didn't. He used the word ecclesia, and it always means a local, a local assembly. Back in 1972... David Green, not me, a different David Green. And he's not even related to me, but he, he decided to build Hobby Lobby. And when he decided to build it, uh, as far as I know, there was, no, there was no question as to whether he was building a, a chain, uh, a store, or a universal thing. Uh, he did what he did, and, uh, and to my knowledge, nobody thought he was building a universal Hobby Lobby. Uh, he, uh, he did what he did. He was very successful with it. Uh, in, fact, uh, in fact, even to this day, uh, there are Hobby Lobbies all across this country, much to the dismay of, uh, of a lot of folks who don't like some of the things that the chain has done, like being closed on Sunday and so on and so forth. But here's the deal. Uh, he started out with one, and, uh, and uh, he, uh, he set up rules about how the others would be and how they would come into being, and, uh, and, 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 and they have. They've come into, we've got one here in Mansfield. In fact, I think it just moved to another location if I'm not mistaken. But each one of those Hobby Lobbies are local uh, and they're visible, are they not? Uh, and uh, whenever he said, hey, I'm going to build my Hobby Lobbies, uh, whenever I'm going to build my Hobby Lobby, uh, he talks about his Hobby Lobby, whenever he talks about those things, nobody assumes 
that he's talking about a universal uh, or an invisible kind of a thing. If I say I'm going to build my house, nobody says, oh, is that a universal thing or a local thing? There's no question about those things. But somehow, whenever Christ said, I'm going to build my church, somehow there's a question about it. Somehow, folks get confused about it. This is what I'm talking about. Where we talk about rightly dividing the word of truth. we got to understand what the word means and understand what the other passages of Scripture have to say uh, in the context of the Scriptures. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 28... Acts chapter 20 and verse 28 says, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, some folks pull this verse out of context and they think that this is talking about a universal church. But again, we got to take this into context. It's very important to know who is being spoken to. And if you go back into uh, the, the context here, uh, which begins at verse 17, it says, And from Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the elders of the church at Ephesus. And so when he says to them, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. He's talking about a local church, particularly the church at Ephesus. Now, is this good advice to other pastors? Absolutely. Is this applicable to the pastor of the church at Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in Mansfield? You better believe it. But is he talking about a universal invisible church or a universal visible church? Absolutely not. He's talking about he's talking about a local church what the word always means. Now some folks will say, wait a minute, he says, which he hath purchased with his own blood. This is what we've got to understand here. Who are members of the Lord's church? Who is members of the church in Mansfield? Who is members of the church at Ephesus? Folks who had been born again and who had been baptized. So was the church at Ephesus purchased by the blood of Christ? Absolutely. Was this church, is this church, purchased with the blood of Christ? Yes, it is. And so this, Acts 20, 28, is not talking about a universal church. It is still a local church. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So, so Matthew... Matthew 16, 18 is not about a universal church. Acts 20, 28 is not about a universal church. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 22 and 23. And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. This verse, uh, these two verses, is considered to be the stronghold for the universal church idea. Uh, but we need to remember, again, the context. This is an epistle written to who? It is written to the church at Ephesus. Where was Ephesus? What is Ephesus? 
Ephesus is, is a place on a map, a local place. That means it's for a local church. Uh, Christ was the head of the church there while it was in existence. That church is no longer in existence, so we can't say it in the present tense, but Christ was the head of the church while it was in existence there at Ephesus. Just like He's the head of the church known as Sovereign Grace Baptist Church in Mansfield, Ohio. He's the head of the church known as the King's Edition Baptist Church in South Shore, Kentucky. He's the head of the church known as the Bible Believers Baptist Church down in Fort Myers, Florida. Uh, he is the head of the church at Indoor Baptist Church, Indoor West Virginia, and the list goes on and on. The word church does not mean here a universal church. And then in Ephesians chapter 3, also verse 21. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. This doesn't mean a universal church, but it's telling us that the Lord's kind of church is going to be in existence forever, but not telling us anything about a universal church at all. If we look at this idea of a local church, I want you to think about three things that we know of in this world to be local. A bride a body, and a house. A bride, a body, and a house. Uh, if you go to the book of Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, begin at verse 23, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church, and gave himself for it. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but it should be holy without blemish. Verse 29, For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. Verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself and the wife See that she reverence her husband. So the picture here that is given is of the wife and the husband, the husband and wife in the marriage. The comparison is between that and Christ and the church. Nobody would ever think that the bride their own bride would be universal their wife would be universal whether visible or invisible certainly what we find here is that the church is compared to the bride and this is further teaching the locality of the church the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Colossians, chapter 1. Verse 
verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Verse number 24 here. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. There are other passages we could look at, but uh, here again in the context, we see that the church at Colossae was compared or said to be a body. What is a body but something that is physical, something that is visible and local, just like the church at Colossae. And so we have the bride, which is visible. We have the body, which is visible. Something that can be said of every church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Something can be said of this church. Something can be said of the other of the Lord's churches, whether they're in the pages of the New Testament or here in the world today. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, 1 Timothy chapter 3, there's one more thing we want to consider. In verse 15, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Here Paul writes to Timothy and he compares the church to the house. What kind of a house do you know of that is universal? There is no such thing. Neither is there such a thing as a universal church. The Bible does not teach it. And so in conclusion, let us go to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4, right where we began. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be to you and peace from him which is and which was, which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. It is interesting to me that the very last message that was given is to seven churches. It was not given to the church universal, but it was given specifically to seven churches. And for good reason. There is no church universal. Much more could be said on this important subject. Much has been said on this subject, although it is, as I said, a neglected truth. There has been much written about it, uh, although lately it seems like the pulpits have been silent over these subjects. But there are, there are a couple of books I would recommend to you. Uh, if you'd like to study more, uh, get, into, get into Scripture, study the things that we've looked at. But there are two old books. I did verify that they are still in print. Uh, one, is, uh, one is Roy Mason. He wrote one, uh, both of these men are with the Lord now, but Roy Mason wrote one called The Myth of the Universal Invisible Church Theory Exploded. The other one, Milburn Cockrell wrote In Search of the Universal Invisible Church. That one uh, is available on the internet in, in its entirety. You don't even have to buy it. But um, both of these men did an in-depth study in the scriptures, which would have taken me a few hours to do, I guess, uh, to explore all of the things that we could have explored about this.
very important topic. But I would suggest that uh, if you would, if you're interested to do those things, to read more, and uh, ask questions if if it's something that you're interested in. Uh, there's. Uh, I've been in some discussions over these things uh, a couple, two or three months ago with, uh, with a man on this. He was trying to convince me that I was wrong. But here's the deal. you got to do it from Scripture. If you can't do it from Scripture, you'll not convince me. The church is local. Nothing, nothing more. You'll not find universal church anywhere in the scripture. The church that Jesus built is local. Now the church that the, these other guys built, they came up with some other things. But the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's always been local. May God add the blessing to his word. Brother Ray, would you please dismiss us in prayer? Father, we thank you for this day and for all your blessings. Father, we thank you for your word and message this morning. Father, help us every time we look into your word, we would understand.